Um, again, we're talking about intimacy with the Father, and, and um, I'm going to be spending some time in John chapter 4, dealing with the woman at the well. Uh, if you walked in today, you saw that little paragraph here against the wall uh, that says our vision. I'm going to re- review that real quick uh, because it's so cool. This is what the Lord, I believe, spoke to us for 2020. The 2020, in 2020, there will be a visitation from our Father drawing us to a place of intimacy. This will bring the inspiration of His Spirit to lead His people into the greater, uh, a greater understanding of their relationship with Father God. There will be an impartation of provision, power, and peace to the point of overflow. His power and presence will fill every area of life, allowing navigation through every storm to peaceful waters and calming streams of joy, favor, and love, for He is with us. That'll be on that wall the whole year because we need to get this in our heart. It's so easy uh, with the cares of life when they hit us to forget who we're connected to. And uh, today I'm talking about spirit and in truth. The woman at the well uh, meets Jesus and, um, and, and they have a visitation. Now, I'm taking a real risk here. When I talk about visitation, it's real easy to have an old concept uh, idea who God is in a new covenant relationship. And let, let's make sure we understand the difference. I, I'm not talking about, in the Old, let's talk about the Old Covenant. In the Old Testament, the Spirit of God would hit somebody and they would do extraordinary things. A prophet, a king, something, the Spirit of God, hey, the Spirit of God hits. And, 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 and they do amazing things, right? And then it, it, it comes off him. It kind of like, it just leaves him out a little while and then it comes back and then it, and it visits and it comes and it goes. That would be Old Covenant. And we say, thank you for that Old Covenant. The Bible says that the New Covenant is far greater than the Old Covenant. What would be far greater than a visitation with that he's with you always? So when I talk about visitation, sometimes because of our background in religion, we, we have an Old Testament you know, kind of concept of Father, and he's a Father in the New, New Testament. He's Jehovah, and he's still Jehovah, but he, he, represents, he, he wants to be represented by Jesus as Father in the New Testament, that will never leave you nor forsake you. So when I talk about visitation, here's what you have to understand that I'm saying. In our life, there are seasons of the soul. There is summertime with Beach Boys. Hallelujah. Remember, everybody remember the Beach Boys? Come on. Don't leave me hanging, please. Yeah, okay. So it's great, sunny, you know, you know, everything going, pool, you know, great water, great. And then the fall comes, nice colors changing, and you get to wear those really cool sweaters that you love, you look good in and stuff. And then comes winter, and you go, what happened? Yeah. You know, winter kicks in, and you got like, everything looks dead and cold, and, and you think, what in the world? And then spring comes. And for every season of the soul, the Father is always with you, but through that season, he'll give you the right word for the right time. Anyone ever experienced that? You're going through a struggle. You go, oh, God, what's going on? All of a sudden, the right word for the right time, for the season you're in. He'll never leave you. As a matter of fact, you, you make sure you understand this covenant God in Matthew 28, 20 says, I am with you always to the end of the earth or the end of the world. In Hebrews 13, 5, he says, for God has said, I'll never leave you and will never leave you or forsake you or leave you or abandon you. So this is awesome. And I want you to look at Romans 8, 38 and 39. It says, I am convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fear for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. And we all say, amen. Amen. Next verse, please. Uh, Nor no power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. He will never leave you, he'll never forsake you, and nothing can separate you. It's really important that we get this, y'all, because inevitably you'll be hit with stuff and you'll, you'll wind up defining who God is by your circumstance. And though you may feel alone, the truth is you're not alone. But the enemy will create a great argument that you are. So you have to know who you're serving. And, and so this, this today is about spirit and the truth, that God is looking for worshipers that will worship him in spirit and in truth. The story. Jesus goes to Samaria, which is the place that most Jews don't go. He goes and, and goes by a well, and he runs into this woman, and he asks the woman for a glass of water. Hey, can I have a water, some water? And he, she goes, you're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan. Why are you talking to me? Because there was a real problem between Jews and Samaritans. They said, don't get along. And uh, it had to do with religion. It had to do with culture. It was just different. And Jesus said, if you knew who was talking to me, you'd ask me for water. Well, and then she responds more like, Man, you don't have a bucket. What are you talking about? You know, this is, this is you know, Jacob's well, so what are you talking about? 
And then she goes, man, I, now I got water for you that if you drank from this water, you'd never thirst again. As a matter of fact, you'd have eternal life. And she goes, man, well, that sounds pretty groovy. Why don't you share that with me? Can, can I have some of that water? I said, well, that's, I'll be glad to, but can you go bring your husband? And she goes, well, I don't have a husband. And then Jesus says, yeah, you're right. You don't have a husband. You've had five husbands, and the one you're with now ain't your husband. And I love the greatest verse in the whole planet, in the whole Bible. I perceive you're a prophet. <laughs> You think, yeah, man, I got, I, just, I perceive you're a prophet. And, and inevitably, when the light is shown on her life, she tries to distract it. Let's talk about religion, shall we? <laughs> you know, I pray. let's talk about uh, how you worship and how we worship. And then Jesus makes an amazing statement. He says, you worship a God you know nothing about, and we worship a God. On that mountain, you worship a God that you know nothing about. On this mountain, we worship a God that we know all about, Well, we don't know him. And then he says this in the main statement in verse 23. But the time is coming. Indeed is here now when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Okay, understand what Jesus is saying. It's not going to be on the mountain of your logic that you've created, a counterculture utilizing some of our great heroes of faith, but it will not be on your mountain of reason nor our mountain of religion. It's going to be by spirit. Church, it was always meant to be by spirit. And when you look at the word spirit, the word spirit translates to breath. It was always meant to be by breath. In order to have the breath of God, you got to be close to him. It was always meant to be the breath of God, the whisper of God. That's what it was always meant to be. And Jesus is saying you're not going to get there by process or procedures of religious stuff. Jesus is saying, it's not going to happen through the Jew Jewish stuff that you've established. Those were type and shadows, but the real has come. It's going to be through this, and it's going to be through worship, by spirit, by breath. Y'all, we were never meant to be people of process to reach God. Remember Isaiah chapter 1, where God says, man, listen, I'm tired of all the feasts. I'm tired of all the stuff. You, you've made that the issue. That was supposed to lead you to me, but you're magnifying the stuff. Come to me. Come, let us reason together, and I'll, I'll, I'll make your sins as white as snow. Come, let us reason. God, it was always about coming and having face-to-face -face relationship with his people, always by spirit. He says, but the time is coming, indeed is here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking the Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. So if the Father is looking for people who are worshiping that way, then why are we magnifying process instead of presence? It's always about presence, y'all. The Father is looking for those who will worship in that way. Verse 24, for God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. This word spirit is the same word you find in Acts 2.4, where the Holy Spirit fell. The breath of God fell the third person of the Godhead, the breath of God. And it actually, in the Greek, it translates to pneuma. In the Hebrew, it's rucha or ruch, which means the breath of God. The same breath that spoke creation into existence. Y'all, this, this, this is powerful to us. You are people of spirit designed by God to create Yes, it's that you are, and if you grasp that you're a person of spirit, then everything changes. And I think what we've done is we've reduced Jesus to logic. And it became even true, truer to me when I, I dealt with the, the rich young ruler and I began to investigate the story. And I, and I you know, I, I understand, I read every article, I get it. The rich young ruler, remember, it's impossible. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Y'all remember that? And I explained to you that there's a lot of writings about it means like this archway in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a city, and in this archway, archway, they created a little door, and what you have to do is get the camel, you unpack the camel, and you take the stuff through the door, and that's the eye of a needle, and then you, the camel crawls through, and that makes all the logic in the world. Or we were told when we were in Israel, when the eye of a needle, that whole idea was basically, it's a piece of rope that you have to untangle the rope, and that way you get the thread to go to the eye of a needle. And that sounds all fine and good, but it removes the power of God and relies upon logic, y'all. 
Because I want you to see how the disciples and everyone that heard that statement, remember, if that's truly the colloquialism, and that's truly the idea of the times, that everybody knows that I have a needle, man, a camel, la, 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 then why did the disciples and those around them that heard Jesus say that, why did they say, then who can get saved? You're right. There is no process to get saved. There is no unpacking enough that you could do to get saved. It's only by the power of God. For God, all things are possible. I think we spend a lot of time reducing the power of God to logic, church, or process that you can develop. Y'all, he's God all by himself without your process. And I think we have to go back. We are people of spirit. Even the power of creation is within your lips. Let me show you. That means, uh, so at Genesis, Genesis 1, 2, it says here, the earth was formless and empty and darkness covered the deep waters. This translates in the Hebrew, a waste, confusion, emptiness, a chaotic state. So the earth was out of control, everything in chaos, right? And it says in verse 2, it says, and the spirit, the ruha, the wind, the breath, the mind of God, the mind of God, the spirit of God, what did it do? was hovering over the surface of the water. To hover means to brood or to relax. And I want you to see his creation is in chaos. And he's going, you know what I'd be doing? Okay, we're going to do it. She's going down, Captain. What are we going to do? Okay, we got to run. We got to Okay, I'm, I got to get some uh, duct tape. If I get some duct tape, I can do this. Come on, you know, can you do the same thing? I can fix this. I can make it. Stop. You are a person of spirit. You're a person of spirit. I'm not going to be motivated by, by chaos. I, I'm not going to rush to fix. I'm waiting on the Lord. And the Bible says that when I know not what to say, when I don't know what to say, that he'll give me the word to speak. I'm not rushing to fix. I've messed myself up more times than not rushing to fix. Anybody with me on that one? Did you get a little ahead of God or time or two? Has anyone gone? Yeah, I think we did. We bought a mobile home. We should never bought a mobile home, but that's another story altogether. <laughs> all, I'm, yeah, all I'm saying, chaos is not a good driver for solutions in your life. God sees something he created in chaos. And he, what he does, he takes a breath and relaxes. Y'all, we can take a clue from that maybe, huh? Verse 3, God said, let there be light. God said, this, this translates to, he willed and he decreed. Y'all, we, this, is, this is our dad and showing us how, to, how we operate. He stopped, he took a breath, and he waited for the right word to come. And then he willed and decreed when he spoke out of peace, out of relaxation. And the way he said it is amazing. And I think we should take a clue from this. He said, let there be light. Truly, it translates to light be. Light be. I, 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 I want you to experiment with, with me this week. Whenever you get a pain or something, you get a report, I want you to stop, take a breath, wait for the Holy Spirit to kind of, and then speak to it without logic. What is that? Well, when you, here's what, here's what you, in the, come on, you know what you do. You get a pain here, you go to Google, whatever. And you find out every aspect of that pain, what it could possibly be, and you create a case, a case of what it's supposed to be. Stop that. You're a person of spirit. <sighs> Take a breath, and you say, healing be. Provision be. Life be. Y'all, that's what dad did. Come on, church. You are a person of spirit, the word spirit, breath. You are a person of the breath of God, the same breath of God that created the whole universe by breath. 
Let that work in your church. Because I think we, we've forfeited who God is because of logic and reason, which is, is it, it can happen. I, we have to remind ourselves that we're people of spirit, not just logic. And then create, create an environment, well, you know, the camel thing, and it just, no, with God, everything's possible. What do you think, church? Come on now. Light be. I like that. He didn't create a, you know, like, you know let's get the molecules and this too, and this. And then. Light be. And it was. Maybe, maybe, church, God is waiting for you to speak a word he can get behind. Maybe whatever they have said, whatever your age brings, whatever, well, you know, you're too young or you're too old or you're disqualified. Maybe, oh, let's put that away and say, God says, thank you, Lord, this is what I speak. And then Lord says, speak it, and I'll get behind it. Why? Because you have the breath of God. You've been listening to him. His will is your will. Speak. So let's go back. Let's go look at Hebrews 11.3. It says, by faith, and this word faith is conviction, moral conviction. By faith, what God did in chapter 1 of Genesis, by faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed, completely made perfect at God's command, at God's decree that what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. What could be seen was chaos, and you can't create from chaos, church. You can't create from fear. You, you, there's something about a prayer saying that comes out of, well, I don't know what to do, and, and God, please, if you will, then you don't understand that you are the healed of the Lord. God, if you just would please don't leave me, then you don't understand he'll never leave you nor forsake you. See, there's something about your prayers that are a little wacky, and they're based on fear. And here's the thing, y'all, I got a call this week when I was flying back from Brownsville, and by the way, Brownsville Mexican food, hallelujah. <laughs> Bro, I'm telling you, unless you've tried the tortillas from the valley, you don't know what a tortilla is. And I think I, think I had menudo every single meal of the day. Shanda, it was awesome. But then we had to get back to my vegetables and chicken, and it was okay too. <laughs> Here's the deal. Uh, I'm, we're flying in, and we, we get a call, in, uh, and when I'm in Houston, Orlando, a certain brother got a you know, stroke, and it looks bad, and we need to pray. So we, we prayed, Kim and I, and with the people on the phone, we just pray in Jesus' name, that person's healed. And then I get a call about five minutes later, it's Orlando. Man, the doctors say, get all your ducks in a row. Get, get your family together, because it's over. The doctor said, get, get his last wishes. Get whatever you got to do. It's, he's done. And so with his brother calling me, I said, okay, let's make sure that we address the elephant in the room because I will not make a prayer in fear of him dying. You know, that, that's the elephant in the room, y'all. I face death with joy because for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Let's, let's get rid of that fear. Just the fear of death is what can also compel you to get even more sick and more anxious because you have a fear. No, there is no fear in death. Death has lost its power over us because we are going to live in Christ. Come on, church. So let's still deal with the fear. Now, I would prefer to live, Lord. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready to live. I feel like I've more to go. But if, but if you take me home, praise God, I'm going home. Are you kidding me? Come on, there is no fear. Let's address the fear. He, now that we've addressed the fear, he shall not die. We stand, if he can't, we stand for his healing. Amen. About ready to get to board. board. This happened in 45 minutes' time. I'm ready to board the airplane, and I get a call again. He said, Orlando, we don't know what happened. The doctor said he just made a quick turn. He's all he's doing really well. All of a sudden, something happened. Amazing. Y'all, in 45 minutes, you are a people of spirit. Speak as a person of spirit of the very breath of God that spoke and creation came to be. Life be. Healing be. Light be. Y'all, come on. That's, what I, that's, that's within you by the spirit. You're a person of spirit. And I think we have forfeited I think we've diminished. I think we've, we've reduced it. So it says, by faith. How did God create? By faith, by conviction, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command that what we now see did not come from anything that, we, uh, that can be seen. And what could be seen was chaos. There was nothing of life to it. So he spoke to it, not from it. I'm not going to be motivated by a chaotic situation to do something. I'm going to wait and speak into it by the Spirit of God. That's the gift he's given to me to be a person of spirit, church. Come on. That's who you are. 
So it says here that by faith, right? Then verse six, it is impossible to please God without faith. This word again translates to conviction. It's impossible to please God with conviction. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe, must believe. The word believe, what it translates to is to think, to be true, to credit, to trust. Okay, so here's the thing. When I, I think about God, I don't think in, in, in like I'm fearful. I have complete trust in him. My days, my past were forgiven. My today is strengthened. He's got my tomorrows. He's got my eternity. I'm cool. He, I trust him. And my conviction is he is for me, right? And I believe, I trust him. What do I believe? I believe that God exists. Now, some of us believe God exists, and he's got a lightning bolt with my name on it, and just at any minute, he's going to say, give me, just give me a reason, dude, and I'm ready. No, that, that, no, the word God exists, this is what it translates, he is present. See, he'll never leave you nor forsake you, right? So whatever you're going through, God is with you. He didn't drop you. He didn't lose you. He's with you. So if he's with you, then you know it's all going to be all right. He's with me. He is present. And I believe my conviction is, my trust is that he's always with me. This is what it says. So it's impossible to please God without conviction, but you must believe that he exists, that he's present, and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. He rewards. I love this in the, in the Greek. It means as if an actor comes on the scene at the right time with the answer. Right? So you're going around, oh, no, what are we going to do in the band? Da, 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 and all of a sudden, da, da, and he makes his appearance, and there's the answer. That he's a rewarder, that when he shows up, and he shows up all the time with the right answer at the right time. How many of you guys have been there? You thought, what's well, going down for last? We just had the situation. What's going down for last time? It's all over. A lot of the call his family. It's done. Oh, something happened. <laughs> Y'all, because we're people of spirit. I think the enemies try to slow us down or give up the power of speaking truth. He rewards. He comes on the scene. He's a rewarder for those who sincerely seek him. You cannot be a one-day wonder with God. This sincerely seek him, it means a really strong, a strong, aggressive word, which means to investigate, to crave, to worship. If all you have is one day with God, then you don't understand your relationship with your father. It's every day. If, if we were old covenant and we had one day of rest with God, we'd say hallelujah. But in the new covenant, which is far greater than the old, we have every day Sabbath church. Yeah. He's with you always. And, and this idea of sincerely seeking him means I'm never disconnected with him. I'm always listening for his whisper. I'm always in worship and honor to him always. I crave him. I worship him. So let me give you a couple of things, the benefits of being a person of spirit, the power of being a, a people of spirit. Amidst confusion and chaos, the spirit of God allows us to relax. Y'all, you don't have to be motivated by fear. You don't have to make decisions out of chaotic situations. Take time, take a breath, because that's the breath of God, and wait for the word of God to speak through you, because it's in you. It's in you. So amidst confusion and chaos, the spirit of God, because your spirit, allows us to relax. <sighs> as counterintuitive as it is to our nature, authoritative words are delivered from peace. That's it's counter, right? I mean, like when things start happening, you got, I got to do, we got to, oh, we got to do something. No, no. Truly, an authoritative word is yes, no, come, go, done. Not playing, done. Out of peace. Why? Because we know God is with us. Authoritative word. As counterintuitive it is to our nature, and authoritative words are delivered from peace, okay? That's the benefit of being a person of spirit. Being people of spirit, the breath of God, we have the power of the will of God. How is that possible? Because you're leaning into his breath. You're always leaning into him. 
You're not elevating your logic. You're not elevating your situation. You're not, you're not determining who God is based on the circumstance. No, you keep magnifying who he is. And because you have this breath connection with him, the will of God is always there before you. Trust it. He's closer than you think. Just, just be still. Be quiet. Like last week, just be still. And the voice of God was found in stillness. We believe that he is present. We believe he is good. And the enemy would want you to believe that he's against you. He is for you. He's not against you. He's for you, church. He is present, and I'm glad he is, and he's good. When God shows up, it's a good thing. Right? Come on. In our chaotic nature, uh, natural life experience, God's gift to us is being people of spirit. Isn't that good, church? Now, we, we are hit 24-7 with natural stuff all the time. And, uh, and truly, to try to get you to react in your flesh. And what we do is we practice responding in the spirit. It takes, that's, that's the discipleship. That's part of our, our growing up. It's easy to want to smack someone in the face. I get it. But to respond, take a breath and go, let me pray for this brother. Let me bless him. What do you think, church? Yeah, that's the whole idea. You've been given this wonderful gift of being a person of spirit, and you can't maintain it just by one day a week, y'all. It's like every moment. But it's a beautiful thing. It's not an arduous thing. It's not like this thing. It's actually the most expressive thing you can do because you truly are a person of spirit. It's the most natural way to live because it really is your identity. You really are this. Zechariah 4, 6, it says, Then he said to me, this is the prophet, this is what the Lord says to Zerubbabel, it's not by force nor by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Now, why is that important, y'all? Because we kings forget. We heirs of the kingdom can forget, and we need to be reminded it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Here a prophet is told, go tell this king, because he forgot. Y'all, the Holy Spirit is trying to tell you all the time, you're not going to get this by running around like a chicken with your head cut off. It's not going to happen. you got to stop be a person of spirit. What does that mean? It you let me tell you. Relax. Breathe. <laughs> I, I got a way to get you there, but I, I want I want to go one step further for you guys today. This is not a trying thing. I'm trying to be. It really is who you are. It's the most natural thing to want to fix something. It's the most spiritual thing to stop and wait. Be empowered and then move. You'd rather move with God instead of move ahead with God and go, God, would you come follow me? What do you think, church? You really are people of spirit. And we're told how to maintain the spirit because it says here, look at this, it says here, in Jan, uh, back to John 4, 23, But the time is coming, and indeed here is now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way, for God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Five times in two verses, the word worship is mentioned. What do you think? Maybe we should worship? Well, if Orlando would sing the right songs, I'd worship. (laughs) You know, God is worthy before, even if I had the right songs or not, he's still worthy. Well, if Darcy would sing, I would really worship. Well, we can sing without Darcy, right, Darcy? (laughs) No, it's not, it's beyond all. I know we try to, man, we try to do the very best we can. We miss an intro, we the guitar, you know, whatever. We drop some things. That shouldn't affect, I was just about to worship, but then the guitar player missed a note. You know what, something, he's worthy of praise beyond what's going on here. And, and we're this disciplined worshipers of Jehovah, not moved by stuff on the stage, but moved by who he is. And there is a power of individual worship, and there's a power of corporate worship. But it's still worship. 
How do you maintain? This word worship is kind of a, 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 a kind of a weird fitting word in the in the in the Greek. It means like like a dog licking the hand of its master. And you go, well, that's really weird. No, no. How many of y'all are dog people in this room? Anybody a dog person? Okay. So tell, tell me if this is what happens in your world. When, when you come up to your house and, and you put the key just in the door and you, you, you just do this and then you open the door, is a dog sitting on a chair going, hey, how you doing? <laughs> no, the minute he heard the key go in the thing, right, the doorknob, he's going, hey, 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 you here? Hey, what's happening? What do you want? Hey, you want? hey let me say what happened. Got gotcha. you. Right, right. So does that mean we're going, y- yes, it means exactly that. That when you say, you see God, God, how you doing? Anything you want to do? Can we, can we do something today? What do you want? You want to go out? Come on. Y- y'all, I'm saying it is in bed. This is not, Lord, we come before you and we worship. That's not worship. That's really, no. God, how, I love you. You're my life. We can't do it any other way. It's just not going to work, y'all. This is, he's everything. And when you approach him like this, then the breath of God is yours. And you speak, and when you speak, there's power because you walk with him. Who do you think put those words in you to speak? Worship honor. He's everything to me. Don't be distracted by the chaos. Don't be distracted by the religious stuff. Don't be distracted by even the good stuff. Keep your eyes on Jesus. You're a person of spirit designed to speak and things change. So I leave you with a tip. Try it for a week. I'm a worshiper of Jesus. I enjoy the gift of being a person of spirit. I sincerely seek him for he is good, he's a good God present in my life so I rest in him. This is who you are, church. And when there's a word at the moment you need it, it will be there for you because you're a spirit person. What do you think, church? Bless the Lord. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I pray in Jesus' name, the Spirit of God takes every word to the very heartbeat of your people, and it, 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 it creates a deposit by the Spirit for your glory and for your honor. I thank you, Lord God, there's the deliverance waiting on the lips of everyone here as they speak by the utterance of the Holy Spirit, and that things are about to change for your people as they know who they are in Christ. I thank you, God. You're calling us to a place of intimacy, of knowing you in a way we've never known you before, to do things we've never done before, because you're a good God. I thank you for calling us for this time that we live in this very moment to be difference makers everywhere we go, for you are King of kings and Lord of lords, and you work through your people. Not slaves, not servants, but heirs of the most holy one. That's who we are, people of spirit. And maybe someone here never received Jesus as Lord of their life. I'd like you to repeat the prayer of receiving Jesus as Lord, if you would repeat after me. Father, and I call you my Father, I thank you for Jesus. I receive him as Lord of my life. My sins are forgiven. My past is forgotten. I belong to you, and you belong to me. I've been taken out of the kingdom of darkness into your beautiful light. I'll never be the same again. In Jesus' name.